Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, last time I was at Cote Ho was uh, in 1998, so it has been a long time. So I'm very pleased to be here again. I'm going to talk today about robust estimation in single price. That was not the topic in 1998, but uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, an interesting area that I'm actively involved in. Okay, so uh, for motivation, uh, why do we look at robustness, uh, robustness in estimation? I'm going to talk about robustness in estimation, not in detection, okay? So, um, of course, uh, with the, the increase of uh, communication applications, you have limited battery power, memory communication bandwidth, it's also limited. You have uh, erroneous uh, sensors or data, and so you have interference all around the place, and you have also in wireless sensor networks, because you have a large scale, high density of sensors, some sensors act at, as interferers to others, and also you have uh, harsh environments and unattended environments. So looking at robustness is an extremely important <coughs> uh, task. Now, uh, classical theoretical approaches to estimation are quite well known and well established. So you assume that the noise or the data is Gaussian distributed, uh, there is a, quite a good motivation for that because of the central limit theorem and of course the mathematical tractability becomes much easier if you do this assumption. But what happens if these assumptions are not valid? And this is the question we'd like to answer today. And I'm going to give you an example of Tohoma Bridge which uh, uh, collapsed uh, some years ago, what some years ago before World War II and it was uh, the third largest suspension bridge. And uh, why I do show this analogy, because uh, Hampel is one of the students of uh, Huber. Huber is the father of robustness in statistics. He said robustness theory is the stability theory of statistical procedures. So I would like to show you this, uh, and I, I'll come back to this example, because uh, it, it also highlights some of the characteristics of robustness, or right, at some of the concepts of robustness. You see this bridge uh, being unstable, okay, and you will see here soon a car here on the bridge driving, and this, of course, becomes even more unstable until what we call in robustness theory the breakdown point. But I'll show you this later on. Okay, now. What are the aims? The aims uh, of um, robust techniques, firstly, the near optimality, because we cannot be optimum. If we want to be optimum, we need to make an assumption of an exact distribution, and this has to be fulfilled. So what we want is that the procedure should behave reasonably good at the nominal model, okay? But it holds also when we have deviations from the nominal model, okay? And then we have another aim, which is qualitative robustness. What is qualitative robustness? Qualitative robustness is uh, the effect of some uh, erroneous observation, okay, even if it takes an arbitrary value. It should not have a, a huge impact on the system or on the estimation task. And the third aim is what we call quantitative robustness. And all these have been defined by either Huber or Hampel. And uh, somewhat larger deviations from the model should not cause a breakdown of the estimation or of the system, okay, of a catastrophe here. So now, how can I quantify if an estimator fulfills these aims? So that's the uh, question we would like to answer. Well, for the first, the near optimality, we could look at the relative efficiency, which is the ratio of <coughs> variances of the optimal estimator under the perfect condition, under the, norm, the nominal model, and that of the method under consideration. And the influence function, which describes the bias impact of an infinitesimal contamination, at some point in the data, okay, start standardized by the fraction of contamination. Now I'll uh, come to that later. And if it is bounded and continuous, this influence function, then we have qualitative robustness. And then there comes the quantitative robustness, quantitative robustness, which is measured by the breakdown point. And this breakdown point is the maximum fraction of outliers that an estimator can cope with, okay, before it breaks down. And this quantity 
is between 0 and 0.5. And I'll explain why this 0.5, it's a very intuitive uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 characteristic. And the higher the breakdown point is, the larger the quantitative robustness. Okay, so let me give you the overview of the talk that was about motivation, where it all began. Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, the measures of robustness, right? Uh, and then I introduce M estimators as robust estimators. And uh, then I'll talk about where we are today and give you some application examples in array processing and in geolocation, right? And then I'll talk about current trends and give you some ideas about what are the challenging tasks for the future in terms of robust statistics for signal processing. Let's look at the very simple model of um, a DC in noise. Okay, so you have observations Xn for n from 1 to n. Let's, here we're talking about IID data, identically independently distributed data. We'll move on to the correlated data case later. Okay, so let's have an observed process, okay, Xn, and we are interested in one constant mu, right? This is uh, the location parameter, we call it, or in engineering, just the DC value. And Vn is a random error with some distribution f. Okay. Now, the task is to estimate mu given IID <coughs> data. And uh, this problem, of course, is uh, wide-ranging in signal processing and many other areas. And I'll give you an example later in geolocation that you can actually uh, reformulate the problem as such. And the most commonly used estimator in this case is, of course, the sample mean, right? You just take the average and then you estimate mu. The question is, is this estimate reliable? Is it optimal? Is it robust? These are the three questions, okay? So, well, uh, maximum likelihood. If uh, we knew the distribution of the noise, okay, so then we can, uh, because under the IID assumption, you take the log likelihood function, and then you do arg max of mu of the sum of the log of x n minus mu, right? And then your estimator would solve this, the, <clears throat> the scoring here where psi, this function psi, is the negative of the derivative of f divided by f, which comes from the log f derivation. And this is called the score function because it scores each observation here. Okay, now if f was Gaussian, then it's clear that psi of x is equal to x. And then you have to solve this. And the solving this means that your mu hat ml is equal to the sample mean, right? And that would be the maximum likelihood estimator. Now if f was Laplacian, right? If f was Laplacian, then your score function psi x is equal to the sine of x, okay? And that is the sample median if you were to solve for this, okay? So that is the optimum estimator in the Laplacian case. Now, the question is maximum likelihood estimate. How about a robust maximum likelihood? Okay, robustness meaning that I don't have F. So here is the breakdown point. Let me talk about the breakdown point. And the breakdown point is this point. This is the amount of outliers that you have in your system so that the, the system cannot cope any longer and it breaks down is the percentage of data that can be replaced by some arbitrary values without driving the bias to infinity, the bias of the estimator. So it's, it's a very intuitive concept and uh, simple quantitative concept independent of any uh, notions of uh, probability. And in small sample situations, it's also very important. Let me give you an example to put everything in perspective. Suppose that we have clean data. These are, <clears throat> these are uh, marked by crosses, okay? We have outliers marked by circles, okay? And we are interested in estimating a location parameter. This is the true value, right, in brown here, okay? So, and you ha have the following situation. Let's look at the first case where I have clean data around the mean, right, and have one outlying observation. Right? If I were to use the sample mean, then this would, the, the bias could be driven to infinity and I have a breakdown point of zero, meaning that one outlier would lead to a breakdown of your estimator. Okay? Now, if you were to take the median, 
right, which is optimum under the Laplacian distribution, okay, you're still okay because the median takes simply the, it sorts the, va the values of the observations and takes the middle point, and that is your estimator for mu. Or the trimmed mean. This is a 25% trimmed mean. Simply you sort your data and you discard 25% of it, and then you have, uh, you, you calculate the mean of the remaining data, and then that's your trimmed mean. Okay, so you're still fine here. Now, if you increase the number of outliers so that you have three circles here on the side, on the right-hand side here, right? So the median is still okay. Why? Because the median is still within the bulk of the data, of the good data, so to say, right? So the estimate here is very close to the true, while the trimmed mean has a breakdown point of 25%, because when you exceed 25% of outliers, then your trimmed mean is no longer uh, good, no longer robust. That's why you have here an infinite bias. And then you have the situation where you have more data on this side than on that side. So you have more outliers than good data. Well, the median cannot uh, help you any longer. Why? Because at this point you cannot distinguish between good and bad data. Because if you have four circles and three crosses, what is good, what is bad? And this is why the breakdown point can maximally be 50%. Okay, so and this is the situation uh, which highlights the aspects of breakdown point in location estimation. <clears throat> well, but what we do is uh, in robust statistics, still in the IRD case, so we uh, calculate the maximum bias, which is the maximum over the family of distributions of uh, uh, theta under F, which is the actual distribution minus theta of the nominal distribution. And this is a function of the fraction of outliers. And it gives you basically this, this bias increase, the maximum bias is increased until the breakdown point is reached here where it goes to infinity. So it displays the maximum possible bias for a given percentage of outliers. And this is a measure that we use in the IID case quite efficiently because it's practical to assess the breakdown point. And the higher the breakdown point, is the more quantitatively robust is your estimate. So why doesn't everyone simply use the median? If we said the median has a breakdown point of 50%, so we're fine, we don't need to do any more research. Well, don't forget the aim number one. The aim number one is near optimality. And near optimality is measured by the relative efficiency, so the efficiency of the median is not good. The efficiency or the relative efficiency of the median is low. It's namely two divided by pi. And here you can see the relative efficiency as a function of the sample size. And uh, it's uh, two divided by pi. But if you were to use a robust M estimator with some few things that uh, you tune your relative efficiency, you can reach an efficiency of 95%. Okay, so we have to keep these three aims in mind. We have to be robust, but also near optimum. So what are these M estimators that apparently give you a breakdown point of 50% and at the same time a high relative efficiency? Well, let's go back to this, what I introduced earlier. So in the location estimation problem, let's replace this log function, log of F, by some function, arbitrary function rho, rho of X M minus mu. Then of course, what you do is you solve for mu hat m, this is the m estimator, m stems from maximum likelihood like estimator, okay? So, and your psi, your score function is the derivative of this row function, okay? And it includes all maximum likelihood functions, and if psi is bounded, then you have breakdown point of 50%. Okay, this is an example of this row function. This row function, say for instance, uh, in the case, uh, so this is uh, suggested by uh, Huber. So rho of x is one half of x squared if the magnitude of x is less than or equal to uh, parameter c hub. Suppose that c hub here is infinity. So you have uh, basically uh, this blue curve. And what you see here is that the derivative of this blue curve of the rho function gives you a line which is not bounded, obviously. Okay, so this doesn't help us. This is basically taking like the sample mean as 
a location parameter estimation. Okay, and if you, you, you tune your C hub, then you have functions like the red one and the green one. What you see is that you bound your observations here uh, up to a certain point, okay? And this is your uh, location score function. Okay, so what is the relation to the influence function? Okay, so that's the location, <coughs> this, uh, location score function or <coughs> the uh, row. And what is it to the influence function? The influence function, again, is important because it analyzes the stability of an estimator. So the stability of an estimator, okay, against changing a tiny fraction of the data drastically, these are outliers, and also rounding errors. These are changing a large fraction of marginally, okay? So basically you have rounding errors. And this influence function is a good tool, right, to look at the stability of an estimator. So if it is bounded and continuous, then you have stability over an entire family of distributions. And this is what we aim for. This is the influence function of estimators of the location parameter mu at the standard, okay, compared to the standard normal distribution, that's the nominal distribution. Okay, what you see here is for the mean, the influence function, right, and <clears throat> you have uh, the median for the median, you see the blue line and M estimator only. Uh, for the M estimator, so you have uh, this uh, boundedness and continuity. Okay, so only the M estimator qualitatively and quantitatively robust. Okay, so this is, this is uh, the idea of robustness in um, the IID case. Okay, so now M1, remember, near optimality. So for the location model, so Huber's M estimator fulfills the first aim, right? Should behave reasonably good at the nominal model. So the efficiency is 95% for the choice of C hub of this parameter of 1.34. This was tuned to be optimum. The qualitative robustness, so if the influence function is bounded and continuous, and the quantitative robustness breakdown point of 50%. That's what you need to retain. That's all you have to remember from the location parameter estimation, okay? So, now, and the robustness for complex tasks we face in engineering today. Okay, this is good in location parameter estimation, IID data. That's an easy task and it has been around for so many years. Question is, what do we do today with complicated problems? Well, complicated problems. We have problems in communication for ex direction of arrival estimation. We'll hear more about that this afternoon, right? And this has been a problem that was investigated by several uh, researchers, scientists, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so the question is how do you do direction of arrival estimation in the presence of outliers on your array, right? And then you have problems in communication like mobile po positioning in wireless networks, okay? So there has been some work around, and I'll show you an example more concrete for geolocation in multi-user detection by Wang and Poor, and we have done some work as well. So in multi-user detection was a hot topic in the past where um, we investigated the problem of impulsive noise. What does impulsive noise do to your multi-user detector? And how do you make it insensitive to impulsive noise? And spectrum sensing, this is a growing area of a robust spectrum sensing and there are some groups working on this problem because of the interference that comes like an impulse right, to the primary user. And in biomedical, biomedical is a huge area of uh, research in view of robustness. Why? Because of the artifacts. Because when you record an ECG signal or an EEG signal, you have artifacts, you have movements of the arms, of movements of the body, so you have always outliers. And the question is whether this outlier uh, has to do with the disease or is it just uh, an external effect? Okay, and th this is a very important area of research. And load forecasting. Forecasting has been around and companies actually do research in robust load, load forecasting. Why? Because of the irregularity of the behavior of humans, right? And there are events, certain events that are outlying like uh, World Soccer Cup or uh, whatever, a bridging day on the weekend. So it, it changes the pattern and this creates outliers and these outliers have to be dealt with in order to do a good forecast, okay, so to optimize the distribution of power. 
Okay, I'm giving you a, a brief introduction to the problem of DOA estimation, right? Like the estimate the direction of arrivals of sources impinging on an array of sensors when you have impulsive noise. Okay, and this has been around for a while, so you have uh, a few sources here impinging on this array from different angles, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. You'd be interested, having observed the sensor array output in theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. Okay. So this is the model, the classical model. We use is complex value, the output, the array output is A times S of N plus W of N. W of N is a K vector valued white noise assumed here. And you assume that you have <coughs> less sources than sensors. Okay, and uh, A is the system matrix of the seeding vectors. Okay, so the idea is to find the thetas from this model. Okay, so we know there are techniques around, many techniques, and we'll talk more about that this afternoon, but uh, let me just uh, remind you of uh, one very simple, uh, very simple um, approach. This is music, namely, we are going to use music. So music is uh, based on the estimation of the covariance matrix, this covariance matrix of the observations, which can be written down as A times the covariance of the signal, uh, covariance matrix of the signal times A, Hermitian plus sigma W square I, where this is the, the variance of the white noise. Okay, and this is the covariance matrix of the signal, positive definite P times P <coughs> matrix. Now, subspace based direction of arrival estimation, as usual, what you do, you do uh, decompose the, the signal in subspaces to a signal subspace and a noise subspace, and you have US for signal and UN for noise, and then you search for peaks in the music pseudo spectrum where you take the P of theta as a function of theta of the angle of arrival, which is one on the norm squared of this <coughs> subspace, noise subspace times the steering vector. And the key idea is simply, when you have impulsive noise, why use the sample covariance? Because in reality, you don't have sigma. You estimate your sigma from snapshots, from the observations. So if you have impulsive noise, then simply use a robust estimate of sigma. And that's the idea that has been around for years. And uh, <clears throat> I'll show you an example here of an eight element uniform linear array, three sources impinging from three different angles. These are the dashed red lines here. And then we use impulsive noise modeled by the epsilon contaminated mixture model. Okay, so where you have a combination of two Gaussians Right, scaled by 1 minus epsilon in the standard normal case here, where epsilon is a small number, is the amount of contamination. So here is 10% contamination. And then you have a kappa, a kappa which is a multiplier of 1 here, that uh, has a, leads to a higher variance of this Gaussian distribution. So the signal to noise power ratio is minus 5 dB. And these are uh, various estimators based on robustifying the covariance matrix estimate. Okay, so if you took the music, simply music, then you cannot distinguish between the, these two sources, and you have this blue curve here, okay? And then there is a sample sign function, or the SCM, this is the <coughs> uh, sample sign covariance matrix estimate, or the tau covariance matrix estimate, this is just normalizing the data, okay, so to reduce the influence of outliers, and you have the maximum covariance determinant based approach where you search for the size of observation of snapshots that would lead to the minimal determinant of the covariance matrix. It's a very tedious task, but there is also a fast MCD. And these, all these robustifications lead to a better resolution of your spectrum. Okay, so this is just an example in array processing where robustness can be introduced and uh, would lead to good results. In robustness for non-stationary data, we have done some, uh, some work here where we replace the covariance by a robust time frequency distribution. Suppose that your, your uh, signals are not stationary, but you have non-stationary signals. Say, for instance, you have a linear FM signal impinging on the array. Um, so how do you deal with this? What you do is you take a, a, a special a time frequency distribution Okay, so instead of taking the covariance, so you have uh, basically distribution, uh, <coughs> special distributions. 
instead of that. So the influence function, we have calculated it in closed form for uh, quite a few um, uh, examples here uh, for the M estimator. Okay, so that's a work by my uh, former PhD student. And you see here the exact, uh, the exact one. And here is the empirical influence function because the influence function can tell you whether your estimator is robust or not as we talked before and boundedness and continuity. So the influence function of auto time frequency distribution with respect to this complex value data. This is the uh, simple example of just two sensors and uh, one single linear FN. Uh, it gets much more complicated, the calculation of the influence function if you have more sources and more sensors. I'll uh, come to another application which is useful because uh, then it goes beyond location parameter estimation but robust regression analysis, okay? And this is a very good example that leads to regression analysis and for localization of mobile user equipment, okay? So what is the task? The task is to localize a wireless transmitter device using different base stations, okay? Using triangulation and um, it is, of course, very important in many, many applications, whether civilian or military applications. And what is the problem? The problem is that you don't always have line of sight, okay? So in the pre if you have line of sight, then it's easy. You use triangulation, you don't have a bias, least squares method would do, right? No problem. In the presence of non-line of sight, okay, then you have a severe degradation of the estimate of the location of the user equipment because you have a huge bias. Okay, so here this is the principle. So you have three base stations, right? This is your mobile unit. And we're using here time of arrival estimation. Time of arrival estimation, so you have um, measurement equations so that you can write yn is h of theta plus vn for some observations. And where h here uh, depends on the position of the base station and the position of, oops, this is an, a, a y, of course and this is the position of your user equipment, okay? And this is what we are interested in, the location of your user equipment theta, the vector theta. That can be linearized, the model can be linearized and written as a regression. So a regression with the unknown theta, where x and e are iid, theta is a p vector, p vector valued, and y of n, are the observations and X from this model that I showed you earlier. So what we did here is uh, an approach where we said the non-line of sight can be captured by a distribution. So statistically modeled by a distribution that can be written as such. This is my density function of the error, which is a epsilon contaminated model where I have line of sight. So with probability of one minus epsilon, and I have non line of sight with a contamination parameter epsilon. Okay? So this is a way to approach the problem. You can approach it in different ways. Non line of sight problems have been dealt with by many, many researchers, and there are many um, solutions out there. Now, the question is how do outliers affect the parameter estimation? Right, and uh, here we are. So if you do least squares, regular least squares, all right? And you have um, outliers. And here in my example, I show outliers for the non line of sight, okay? But in general, for regression analysis, you have two types of outliers. You have the so-called bad leverage points, the X outliers, and the vertical outliers. Some are more dangerous than others, okay? So if you were to use maximum likelihood approach, so you could, you could minimize with respect to theta your residuals here, okay, then it's not robust. Not robust against any of the outliers, whether in X, bad leverage points or good leverage points. Okay, an M estimator, as we discussed earlier, right, would lead to a better estimation, a robust estimation. And what I show you here is this is the bulk of the data in this regression example, and here is the, the true theta, okay? And what you see here is the maximum likelihood leads to a bias in red here, right? Because the bed leverage point pulls out this theta towards this axis. 
while the M estimator, which is based on Huber, as I showed you earlier, is more robust, but it still creates a bias. Okay? So the M estimator has a breakdown point of zero for outliers in bad leverage points. Why? Because if you were to solve this problem, then you end up doing this, so you're scoring the residuals, and you have here x multiplication with xn, and if you have bad leverage points, then this will have a huge effect on your estimator. Okay? So there are some suggestions out there how to improve the regression analysis robustly okay, with other estimations. So for instance, the S estimator, suggested by Rusev, right, where you take basically the arg mean with respect to theta of this robust scale estimator of theta, okay, which combines basically the high efficiency and breakdown uh, point or attempts to, but it is robust, but it's not efficient. And a more suitable regression analysis estimator is the MM estimator. What does the MM estimator? It's, it attempts to use for the robustness as an initial estimator, the S estimator, and then improves right, the efficiency in an iterative manner. So you start with calculating a high breakdown point estimate, theta hat S, then you compute the high breakdown point M scale of the residuals of step one here, and then you compute an efficient MSF regression using iterative procedure at theta hat S. And then you go around, it's, uh, it, it's uh, expensive, but you have a highly robust and an efficient estimation in a regression where the efficiency, relative efficiency, is by 95%. This is an example coming back to the geolocation problem. So if you look at the sigma and uh, non-line of sight, and this is the mean circular positioning error in meters, and you see um, the different estimators or the results for different estimators. We have 10 base stations, five measurements at each base station. We have contamination of 40%, okay, and this sigma line of sight is 150 meters, and uh, we use an exponential density for the epsilon mixture model. Okay, so here you see the least square estimator is not useful because as the sigma and non-line of sight increases, it goes to infinity. The same with M Huber. M Huber is not good because of the efficiency, as I mentioned earlier. It's not the answer breakdown point of zero as well. So the only ones that do a good job are the S estimator and the MM estimator where you see uh, this uh, good performance uh, with respect to the non-line of sight. So, and there are now, I mean, very fast algorithms to compute basically robust and efficient estimators for linear regression. Okay. Well, what is the challenge today? The challenge today is dependent data. Dependent data is difficult because those concepts I talked about, like the influence function, the breakdown point, and so on, cannot be translated easily to the dependent data case, right? And also remember this regression. Remember the outliers, the bad leverage points and the vertical outliers. Suppose that you have an autoregressive process of order one. You can write x n plus a x of n minus one is equal to z n, right? So you can write this as a regression, x n is equal to minus a times x n minus one, right, plus z n. And now, if you inject outliers, whether they are innovation outliers in z n or additive outliers and so on, you have a multiplicative effect of outliers because of this regression, right? So this is why we have a challenge. I don't have uh, those details, but I, I could uh, talk about that later on, okay? So, and this is the, the future directions for robust uh, signal processing where robust ARMA models have been already used, uh, but uh, just for one one, order one one, I mean, there is a, a need for more research. Robust forecasting in robust spectrum estimation also, it has been used. Um, what we are doing at the moment is now talk a little bit about our research is robust model selection. And 
um, GEP box, and you know it from uh, the econometrist and the statistician, wrote once, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, so, and this is a very, very wise statement I, I like, okay? So let me uh, show you the difference between those, those modeling approaches. So you have a non-parametric approach or parametric approach. So if you use a non-parametric approach, suppose that we want to estimate the spectrum, right? You use a non-parametric approach based on the periodogram. Well, the periodogram, I smooth the periodogram or you, you split the data into segments, you average periodograms, well, the only assumption you make is stationarity. Stationarity, which is quite wide, okay? So you'll find a lot of applications where this might be fulfilling, but the results are not that great. In a parametric approach, you would restrict your process to a model, right? Which is not always valid, say an ARMA model, right? So you have very accurate results if the model is adequate. So the applicability the, the range of applicability is narrow, right? But it's very, very good. So what do we try to do with the robustness? Robustness is be basically around the model here and allow some deviation. So we are, this is a compromise between non-parametric and the parametric approach. So it performs well when the data is in the neighborhood of an assumed model. And this is why robustness is always good. So I'm going to talk about uh, robust model selection. Uh, there has been some work done in, in here, okay? And what is the approach or the, the aim? The aim is to find a model that best fits the majority of the data. That's what it is. That's a robust model selection. And uh, so I'm going to, not to go too much into the details, but just give you the gist of the idea of what we're trying to do. So this is an autoregressive moving average model. Okay, so XN, right? This is the AR part, this is the MA part, okay? So P and Q are the orders, okay? So these are the parameters of interest, and we assume that we have uh, white noise with variance sigma Z squared. So we have different types of outliers. You have additive outliers, you have innovation outliers, you have batch outliers, and so on and so forth. But let's assume that we have an additive outlier. An additive outlier meaning that the process, right, because you can, this is, this models basically a white noise process, through a rational filter that gives you an ARMA process. Okay, so the output is Xn, so you add some outlying process Vn, and Yn would be what you observe, okay? So this is the contamination. Now, what we are trying to do is basically use an information criterion-based model selector in taking this part, right, and robustifying it, okay? Robustifying. And there are many ways of robustifying it, and some work has been done with that approach. But what we are trying uh, to do is the bounded influence propagation model, use a, a BIP. We call it a BIP. Okay? So basically, we try to find the best robust estimator for theta for all these parameters in order to get a very accurate model. So, and this BIP is basically changes the model, right? This part that you saw before, okay? So it becomes this. And note here that if I take psi of x equal to x, psi of x equal to x, it is exactly zn minus k divided by sigma. It cancels sigma. ak zn minus k with the negative sign cancels with this one. Then you are exactly in the ARMA model with orders p and q, okay? So this is just to bound this term here, okay? It's an auxiliary model to robustly estimate ARMA models, okay? So R is the maximum between P and Q, so if R is larger than P, then you have all these autoregressive parameters zero, and R larger than Q, then the um, moving average parameters are zero. And this sigma is a robust M scale of Zn. Okay, so, this is an example to show you, to demonstrate the difficulty of outliers in correlated data. This is an ARMA model. Okay, so use, suppose that I have an ARMA model with additive outliers, okay? If I want to 
inverse filter, my ARMA process with the true parameters, not, not estimating them. And this is the location of the outliers. What I get is, is this smeared effect, okay? Because I'm taking YN and inverse filtering YN. YN is XN plus VN, right? With those single outliers, that's what I get. So this is very difficult, of course, to lead to, or it's, it's pretty detrimental to estimating the parameters of an ARMA model. So if I, <coughs> if I were to use a BIP model, then I can, I can single out the outliers. And when I single out the outliers, as you can see, then I must, must have better estimates. Okay, and this is the problem. So left out innovations estimate using this ARMA 2.1 model in blue, and right innovations estimate using BIP ARMA 2.1. Okay, so this BIP is a very powerful tool. And uh, now all we have to do is basically estimate the scale. So there are different ways of estimating the scales. We could use an M estimate of the scale of the innovation sequence here you, uh, by this. Um, the good thing is um, it's robust, but it's not efficient. This M scale by Huber is, is not efficient. So what some statisticians have tried to do is basically uh, select this row data dependent so as to achieve robustness as well as efficiency at the same time. Or in other words, you could use two rows, right? Row one, which is a function for the, that controls the robustness, and another row which is tuned for efficiency. And this is the so-called tau estimator. The tau estimator is a very efficient and robust estimator of scale. And if we have this robust scale, then we can find our tau, uh, sorry, our theta, the estimate of the, the model A and B, right? Then I, I can uh, have a robustification of this likelihood function and I have a better, a better model selector. So the tau estimator is highly robust, highly efficient, automatically yields highly robust, efficient the residual scale estimate, okay? So, it's basically equivalent to weighted sum of two MSCMA with data dependent weights. That's what you are trying to do. And I'm not going to go through the algorithm that we proposed. I'm going just to show you here the last equation. And this is the, the information criterion in P and Q. And then you can see this is the scale, the, the robust and efficient scale estimate, right? The tau in P and Q. And you, you have here the rho, rho tau as well. And then your alpha, this is the penalty function. And this leads to the following results. So you can see the base in information criterion, right? So this is the clean data. And this is with additive outliers with epsilon equal to 5%. This is the amount of outliers, OK? So uh, the alpha PQ here is equal to B plus, uh, P plus Q log N on N, as, as known. And uh, here we, that's our proposal what we propose with the uh, clean data because you should not suffer, of course, when you have clean data. So we have 95% of correct selection of the orders P and Q, right? And when we have an amount of 5% of uh, outliers, we have 86% of the time, the right estimation. And this is uh, BIP or OB scale. This is when this uh, tau scale estimator is plugged into the BIC. So you don't do this estimation, as I showed you, is just replaced the sigma by a tau scale. And the performance is, of course, much lower. And there is uh, uh, Andrews who suggested uh, using ranks for this. And uh, uh, she thought that you get uh, good results. But in our experiment here, with those data, it was not, not that good. It was not useful at all. OK. What are? The other challenges in correlated data, robust estimation, very small sample sizes. This is nearly an untouched area. The robust bootstrap, why? Because in bootstrapping, you resample your data. And if you have outliers, right, and you resample your data, you may create more outliers than initially the initial number of outliers. Um, 
And then a robust M estimation for complex value data. This uh, has been investigated by uh, Essa Olila from uh, Helsinki, Alto University, a student of Visa Koivonen. And he has been doing a lot of work in this area and robust detection of circularity, for instance. He has been also doing work on that. So this, these are challenging areas. And um, distributed systems is becoming very important because this is uh, the way that uh, uh, the future is, <laughs> is going to. So, but the current methods for distributed systems are not robust. The first robustifications have been appearing here, and this is one of my PhD students who are working on distributed uh, signal processing estimation uh, in a robust way. Well, I don't have conclusions, but I have op just a statement that optimality is important. Let me just show it again. Optimality is important, but robustness is the engine's choice. Thank you very much for your attention. So, good and time.